You've been spending quite a lot of time, quite a lot of your life, I guess, investigating this kind of spirituality, atheism, and your new book is actually called The Spiritual Atheist. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a really interesting place to start. There have just been some very high profile interactions, meetings between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, mm -hmm. discussing exactly these topics, mm -hmm. um, the renewal of religion versus atheism. And I've kind of thought that one of, in a way, I, I see they're talking past each other a lot of the time. Yeah but also that the idea of kind of spiritual atheism as an expanding the concept of atheism beyond what it is as a kind of pure negation of religion and integrating science and saying, well, actually, these things are not um, opposed to each other could be a way through. In my experience of the religion versus science war, you could call it, is um, really a war because it's two positions. And um, I think the, the atheism that we've seen for the last 50 years um, has become a very specific type of atheism. I don't think it's all atheism. I don't think it's what atheism was when um, Francis Bacon, who was the uh, purveyor of the scientific method, wrote a book on atheism. Um, atheism has become essentially materialism, or material, what I call materialist atheism. It's a, it's, a, it's a species of atheism, which is virulently against anything that's not measurable in matter. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean what atheism has to be. And I guess what I've been trying to find is a form, an expression of atheism that fits with my love of science, my belief in reason, my belief in my mind, my belief in intellect, my belief in proving things um, as best we can with science, whilst acknowledging that science has always been a project focused on matter, and it hasn't ever wanted to speak about consciousness and the inexperience of our lives and the subjective experience. It decided not to, very early on, it said, we're not going to do this. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We're just not going to include it in science. And I believe spiritual atheism is, I guess, um, evidence-based. Um, the evidence of science is obvious, I don't have to go into that bit, the sort of atheist evidence base. But I believe that there's an evidence base for spiritual experience, which is millions of years of well, thousands of years of traditions, exploring that if you go inside, cry on your busy, busy mind, intellect, um, find out how to access this heart area, which I will call metaphor, not necessarily the heart, but the experience of thinking from here, not from here, this little bit here, then evidence, the evidence shows you that you will experience some form of unity, ecstatic or quiet, um, continuation, continuousness between me and other which is transformation, that changes everything about your life. But the oneness experience. The oneness experience, whatever you want to call it, however you get there, and there's so many different ways to get there. But it does, once you've had that experience, it becomes an organizing truth that then re-aligns everything around it. And what I had to do myself was how did I make peace with this becoming the organizing principle of my inner life, but still have science being the organizing principle of the external world, which I don't argue with because it's brilliant at that. So that's what I've sort of been working on, is how do you transcend those two positions? Um, because otherwise you get just talking past. You get the atheist staying an atheist. Maybe they admit to meditation being useful from an instrumental sense of stress and, and whatever. And, and maybe they admit to ritual being really good and like you get the kind of new churches, the atheist churches where the congregation comes. But they won't ever admit to a mystical truth. And then you get the religious person going, well, I just believe in some kind of revealed truth. And um, science is useful and everything. And they're both right. Mm. But you have to find a way to lift them higher, um, which is ultimately what spirituality or wisdom is about, which is about finding opposites and then bringing them into harmony with each other. Um, as Heraclitus, uh, one of the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers said, you think those things are different, but actually they're part of one thing. And he called it a palantonic harmony, um, creative tension. And I think that's the job, is how do I get myself as a green individual? How do I get to a place where I can embrace what science has to say? Because it really does work. It's really useful. <laughs> um, keeps us alive. Um, but it can never answer questions about this thing. It, does start, it doesn't, wasn't meant to. It doesn't design to. And when you get someone like Daniel Dennett, the, the philosopher, saying that even the consciousness through which I express this thought and write my book is an illusion. You know that's something not right there. You know, it just doesn't, it's just purely from a pragmatic point of view. But in a way, the, 
he's followed through this materialist. Exactly. Like he's, he's thought things through to the log logical conclusion yes. and isn't scared of the conclusions he's reached. It's like, yes. if, if this is the, the, where this materialism has left me, exactly. then I am going, you've got to admire his kind of dedication to the course. It's logical. If you're going to think a thought, you have to follow it through. And in fact, part of all philosophy has to be, if I hold this to be true, I need to make sure I've got rid of all, um, what do you call them, like little nubbles of potential um, self-contradiction. Uh, which, is, which is what's really interesting about the times now, because certainly online, and I think also in, in the, among the gatekeepers of the media, mm -hmm. for quite a long time, these, this sort of, the, I call them the four horsemen of the, mm -hmm. of, of the atheist, mm -hmm. or the four horsemen, Daniel Dennett, Hitchens, yeah. um, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, yeah. kind of this sort of very strong materialist atheist bent Absolutely. held sway. Yes. And what's really interesting, especially with the kind of success of Jordan Peterson, mm. but more generally, is I see a lot of people online starting to at least say, I now appreciate religion for the first time. I now mm. appreciate spirituality for the first mm. time. I was an atheist and now I, my conceptions of what religion is for and the, the reality that it's pointing to is, is deepened, yes. which is a really interesting time. It feels like there is an opportunity for a new synthesis arising, yes. which is why I think the spiritual atheist perspective is really interesting. There definitely is. I think uh, I'm, I'm out there a lot in the world. Um, I teach a lot of people um, uh, this kind of stuff um, from a practical point of view. I spend a lot of time doing leadership work, which is um, really very pragmatic. It's, it's an organisation wanting its people to perform better. And, you know, it's a dangerous line for me to be talking about some of these, this content because there's a separation between church and state, which basically means corporation and religion. They don't, shouldn't be involved. You know, if you want me to be in your company, it's great, but don't put me on a Christian programme. That would be outrageous, right? So therefore, don't put me on a leadership programme that's got some guy talking about spirituality and love and because I see that as religion. So I've always been very aware of that and you know, respectful of that separation. But I can't do my job properly unless I teach people about this unit, unitive experience of oneness and what then emerges in your body, in a very embodied, practical way, is feelings of love. It's like, oh my God, I feel love. Why is that relevant to the corporate environment? Um, because another word for love is truth. Another word for love is purpose. So if you want a corporation, we want to be a purposeful organization, which most 21st century companies say that. There's no way of getting and avoiding the conversation. Eventually, it has to come around to something you call love. You can call it passion, compassion, caring, but they're just ways of avoiding the reality, which is we're talking about loving the world, <laughs> loving our consumers. <laughs> you know, this is a big conversation. Same with leaders. You can't talk about being a generous, service-oriented servant leader without talking about caring for your team, which is love again, right? Um, so it's a really fine line, but what I've noticed in the last two or three years is I'm now, I almost avoid it more than I need to, because people are asking me, but don't you mean talking about love? I'm like, wait, you want to use that word? Yay, I'd be love to use that word, but I won't use it until you use it. But, but there's a demand, there's a yearning. Um, and I think the challenge I think I've got, we've got at the moment is let, how do we re-enchant the world without religion? Because I'm quite anti-religious. That part of my milit militant atheism is very much alive in me. As soon as I feel any kind of rule book, anyone saying this is the pathway rather than a pathway, this is the model, and you see it across the whole personal development slash spiritual space, is you see people erring towards religion, you see people putting people into guru slash priest mode. So I'm like, that stuff, I feel like sick with it. So for me, the question is, how do you re-enchant the world without religion in its organized sense? Um, and it has to come from individual, it has to come from inside. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's the, I think it's the great topic of the next 20, 30 years. And another really interesting topic that you've talked about in the past is the idea of the J-curve, mm -hmm. which is something I think is of a huge relevance now, mm -hmm. especially where a lot of us have the sense that things are breaking down. And I'll, I'll let you explain the J-curve in more detail, but the idea is that you cannot move from one state to another without going through a dissolution. And a lot of people struggle with that dissolution because they say, we're here, we want to move to here. Yes. But you have to, and this, this goes for personal growth as well. If you, want, if you want to improve how you are in the world mm -hmm. and you have to give up your per, some parts of your personality that were working okay, 
go into chaos before you can come out the other side. Yes. And that's a really interesting subject. I think it's a really interesting model of like it's it's almost a um, I think it's an essential thing for people to know. If you want to change anything, expect them to get worse first. Can you Absolutely. can you can you describe that? So the tradition the materialist way of looking at change is linear. So um, as you say, you want things, I want, I'm here now, my life's okay, my relationship's okay, but they're not really intimate, they're not really conscious, they're not really juicy. I want to make them more conscious and juicy. I just want to go from here to here. Um, and the great tragic comedy of life, does, and I believe it's designed in, I don't know by who, if we don't get into that topic, but it's designed into our system, human and therefore all systems, political, um, organisational, that before you get from where you are to this um, better place, and when I say better, I don't necessarily mean externally validated as better. I mean, for me, better as a fit, a better fit with the world. Better fit with your lover, your children, and your company, the way the world's moving. You have to first go down, and that down movement is the dissolution, as you say, of, of old archetypes, of old personality structures, um, of old belief systems, and ultimately of feelings. Um, then you touch something new, something emerges in that moment, which is fresh. We call it an epiphany, an insight. Um, a realization aha and then you go up and try and build that into your everyday life your everyday work your everyday patterning um, which takes often months and years which again no one wants to talk about so the bit everyone wants to talk about is i was i was lost and now i'm found you know the the, the two endpoints of the of the curve of this transformational curve j curve breakthrough curve use different words which also maps onto the hero's journey. Absolutely, maps onto the hero's journey. It maps into everything. Learning curves of, of learning. It maps onto entrepreneurship. You know, uh, startup companies have to first spend a lot of money, and maybe they come out with a product that works and they can make a lot of money. But for five years, someone has to have trust and faith that they're going to do that. It, it also maps onto political theory. So um, old do, uh, dictatorships break down, um, but it doesn't mean something going to be all wonderful democracy. It's probably going to be years of chaotic. Uh, stuff. And that's what you're seeing at the moment is people trying to get away from that because it's painful, but not in the direction of newness, in the direction of oldness. Make Britain slash America great again. Um, it's just trying to return to the old point you were in, which can never be relived because it's gone. It's, it's, it's a time based. Um, and in this, whether it's your personal journey of change or whether it's trying to change the world, we have to be okay with um, things being disassembled. Um, but the key is to have the center hold. Um, and for me, and this is why I was a reluctant spiritual person, the only thing I've found that can keep the centre holding. And I mean that in the most philosophical and most pragmatic sense. Literally, how to feel okay in the middle of a breakdown of your old life, versus also how to feel okay as the US deconstructs itself and hopefully something new comes, um, is what we would call spiritual, which is love, which is connection, which is this sense of oneness. It's the only thing I know that's bigger than the fear and the, the chaos of, of disassembly. Because the only thing you can really trust is what you go deep enough inside yourself to find, or what? That's part of it, but the, I guess from a philosophical point of view, the only truth that I've found that can't be deconstructed by cynicism, scepticism, um, is, is this truth of oneness. Um, so that's partly, so philosophically, it's the truth of oneness. Emotionally, it's the feeling of oneness. We've labelled love. So people say love is the truth, love is the message, love is the answer. What they're saying is, um, the only thing that remains when you break down all your old patterns that you use to survive life, to deal with your mum and dad, to deal with the pain of existence, when all that dissolves, the only thing that's left that you can hold on to is this experience of oneness slash love slash connection, which is what we call spiritual. So I didn't want to be in the spiritual world. I didn't want to be a spiritual teacher. I didn't want to be anything to do with this thing. It's the least cool career. If you grew up in London, in the 90s and you go to Cambridge University and study science, um, it is the least cool thing in the world. I mean, literally. Um, but it was the only truth that I kept coming back to over and over and over again. And often I would, for years, I would discount it. Um, I would get rid of books I had. I would laugh at yoga and meditation and as we easy to do, right? But it kept coming back to me. And until I accepted it in, I couldn't get out of my own Jacob. I was stuck down the bottom over and over again, reliving depression, reliving anxiety, reliving old patterns. So your background is, as you said, in science, but also in philosophy? Yes, I um, studied science first, but I wanted to be a medic, um, so I studied uh, medical science. Then I was very lucky, I was given an opportunity to spend a year doing something else, and I chose philosophy of science. Um, and that was where I first had like a explosion 
of realising that science isn't the only way of understanding the world, and that even philosophers of science can see that science is as much constructed as it is discovered. So science isn't just discovering the truth of nature, we also bring with us our own mind and concept. Um, and in fact, you can't understand data without concept. Is it a bit of, sort of Thomas Kuhn? Thomas Kuhn, Blew My Mind, uh, Foucault, yeah. the Scottish School of the Construction of Science Theory. And I'm not a hard constructionist. I don't believe all science is constructed by theory. Um, I believe there are data points, which yeah. we call facts. But to make sense of those facts, you have to have narrative. And narrative is conscious, and narrative is choice, and narrative of whether quantum theory you believe in the many worlds interpretation, or you believe in the Bohmian a pilot wave interpretation, or the Copenhagen interpretation, no fact will ever tell you which of those is real. This is the amazing thing about science, is you, we can't verify which, because we're talking about something that's unverifiable. So by some nature, there's always going to be a choice about what narrative structure we interpret the data in. Um, and that means science isn't just a pure fact. It's constructed a little bit, which is something that the traditional four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse um, would ne can't stomach. Um, uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we have to be able to understand that science was designed to understand matter. From the beginning, when Galileo literally wrote and said, I'm going to get rid of subjective experience, not in brackets, my brackets, not because I don't think it's real and great to have feelings of love and awareness and awe, but because we can't measure it, it's never going to be able to be measurable and therefore it's a pain in the ass for science. Let's just get rid of it and focus on what he called the primary qualities or primary properties. That's what science is good at. Let's not force it to then become an arbiter of conscience and consciousness. Um, and the, the science of consciousness has always been what people call the wisdom traditions. And I guess we're in, I hope, a time where we've had such a lurch towards materialism, um, certainly in philosophical life and certainly in statehood, um, that people are going, this is too much, it's too much emptiness, it's too much externality. I've got a life in here. I want some meaning in this life. The challenge we've got at the moment is, do people then go right back into religion again? which in the US you have seen. Um, but what gives me hope is there's now a 25% group of people in the US who call themselves spiritual, not religious, which is what I'm trying to give a philosophy for, ultimately, an underpinning for. Um, because otherwise, the problem you've got with spiritual, not religious is what I, you know, I don't know, I, I or others call the fruit salad approach to spirituality, is that you pick all the bits you like. I want a like bit of apple and a bit of cherry, I like a bit of tantra, and I like a bit of this chakra stuff, and I like a bit of this stuff. But I don't want all the other bits that come with that particular tradition, which is transformation, giving up the old, uh, challenging my belief structures, challenging my ethics. Well, integration of the shadow. Integration of the shadow. Yeah. Particularly ethics. I think that's the big issue with New Age life at the moment is you can fruit salad all the stuff you like, the bliss bits. And that's a big problem, the blissing out of, of spirituality. Um, because ultimately, all, if you stay in one tradition, you end up having to do the shadow work. Because that's what they're designed to bring you into, right? Um, and that's painful, and you need a lot of rigour and a lot of discipline. And I think New Agery has gone in, has, has just avoided it all. And that's why so many atheists look at it and go, what a, a pile of mumbo-jumbo nonsense. Well, also, I think there's a... It's partly that, but I also think they're put off by the kind of people. It, yes. it's, not just, it's not just what people are saying. It's, they look at people's Absolutely. actions in the world and think, well, if that's spirituality, I don't want a piece of that. And so big, much hypocrisy involved so much. by people who are only doing the bliss out thing and not doing the inner work and not doing the kind of recognition of I might be an angel but I'm also a demon. Correct. And without that shadow integration, it just means nothing. The whole thing is a, is a trip of, the, of a blissful ego. And that's why Christianity, for example, or the older wisdom traditions that do integrate that other side, mm -hmm. and at the core of them they have stories like Cain and Abel. This is what happens if you get this resentful. <laughs> this is how, this is what resentment against being, yes. which in itself is a theological thing. Yes. Resentment against being on some deeper level, like the way that people act in the world is a reflection of a deeper theological truth, yes. was something that really, re, I guess, reawakened in me a kind of respect for those wisdom traditions. Mm. Including Christianity? Yes. Interesting. Um, I guess Christianity, ironically, of all the Western traditions, is the one I least know about. I think growing up as a Jew in a Christian society didn't massively enamour me to, to the path. 
um, but also listening to the... To the but also to the, many of these stories are in the Jewish tradition as well. Well, that's the bit that turned me off, the Old Testament. The, the fire and brimstone and the anger and the, this God, this disembodied voice going, wah, wah, wah. Um, I can now look at those texts and I can see wisdom in them. But when they're taken uh, literally, uh, the connotation versus the denotation, when they're, when they're taken, uh, den- you know, the, when, we, when we take the story as the story, which is what most religions of the book actually still do, they take the story as the story, um, and miss out the metaphorical narrative mythic meanings that are actually the interesting bits. For me, it was just a big, no thank you, no, not interested in any of that. It doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, but I've read a, a translation of the Lord's Prayer, for example, uh, from the original Aramaic in a poetic, mythic way. It's amazing. Beautiful. It's all about oneness. It's all about how to stay connected to yourself, even though all these difficult things are happening in your life, not to be resentful, not to be angry, not to be dis- disconnect, not to separate. Um, and I th- and, and obviously, as Christianity is the primary religion of the world, um, it's really important that, that there's an access to Christian mysticism and Christian uh, Gnosticism for people so they can find that wisdom again. Um, uh, it's, just, it's not my particular meaning path. Because I do think we are in a time where, so if the, if the 60s were a time where we started becoming really aware of the Eastern traditions for the first time, kind of integration of Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, if there is another awakening happening now, and I think there is, and I think what we're seeing is an integration of the, the, the Western traditions at a deeper level, Christian mysticism being one of them, um, probably the esoteric tradition, a new interest in that, because we're actually seeing a lot of things bubbling up through the kind of corners in our culture, which is a really interesting time to be. And in a way, there's a, there's a, there is a potentially a deeper resonance within us with that, because they are our lived traditions. They're coming from our, our own culture. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, if we think about the Western tradition, you've got, again, this, this dialectic, this flip-flopping between external focus and internal focus. The great one was the scientific revolution and then the romantics. It's going, hold on a minute, what about love? What about um, passion, creativity, the genius of the individual, all that stuff, right? Um, my hope is that we don't flip-flop again. And I think one of the problems we've got in all areas of our society is we have this pendulum that goes mass patriarchy, let's go all about the feminist. And we just flip-flop between these extremes and there's never goodness in the extremes. Um, and my hope is we don't do what we did uh, in the 60s, which we gave up the goodness of science and the goodness of material world and entrepreneurship and all these things that really matter here. I mean, forget all this, I'm gonna be a hippie and give it all up and burn my everything. Um, which we kind of did again in the rave scene of the 90s and the, even the Burning Man countercultural sort of experience. Um, I hope that we can live in this world, um, but bring in the other world into it, rather than think we have to go off grid and burn everything to do with the sort of capitalist advanced structures that we're in. Um, and I guess another way of putting that is, I certainly am not countercultural. I'm for the culture. I believe in the culture. I believe because culture is just us, it's society. I don't want to fight the man. I want to hold the man. Um, I don't want to stick it to him. I want to hold him and go, it's okay. You know, you are loved. You look just like I say to my kids every night. You are part of this universe. You're loved, you're wanted, you're invited here. Um, and it's time to let go of all that patterning and that protection and allow yourself to feel, feel again and feel caring and compassionate again and all the things you want. And you want this anyway, man. Stick it, you know. So as soon as we stick it to the man, we get back into the worst excesses of new agery where you're just sitting going, well, I'm not that. Um, and um, I think the, the, if we can bring these Western traditions back in ours, you know, they're in the land, um, the Druids thing, you know, that, that whole uh, piece where, interestingly, the political and the spiritual were part of one conversation. You know, the Druids were the politi- politicians of their time. Um, the Taoists were originally advisors to, you know, the, the big guys. Um, and they, they, they became a folk tradition afterwards. Um, and actually, Dazm's an interesting story because then they, because the, the politicians sort of rejected them uh, as a path, and they went back into a more externality path, um, they then resorted into what became alchemical Taoism about sex and, and stuff. And one of the things I really hope we do, do at this awakening moment is I hope we don't go, well, capitalism sucks and politics sucks and liberal, liberal democracy sucks. 
Um, so I'm just going to go and invest in all this esoteric, esoteric stuff and the medicine plants and all this stuff. I really believe it's time to own all that. It's ours. It's our tradition. Um, it's part of our tradition. And it came from actually from a Christian mindset, right? This, that science and capitalism were intrinsically linked to Protestantism and all this sort of stuff. But just bring this softer, loving, um, juicy, dare I say, feminine uh, holding within the centre of it. Um, and that will, and I hope that will break down the, the, the worst successes of capitalism without pretending there's something else that's going to work better. So actually, I, I talk about this idea of connected capitalism or compassionate capitalism, um, where we're guided by purpose, truly guided by purpose. And that means giving up things um, so we can bring love into the system.